Hey, good morning and welcome back to Taylor Time Live. I'm your host, Seth Gladden, and today we have a great show for you. Uh, we're gonna be talking about Hospitality Horizons <coughs> and taking a look at, um, at the hospitality market, kind of how it's shifted, what's changed through COVID, supply chain issues, uh, where we see the market going, any installation challenges involved with that market. So we've got a great show for you um, and we'll definitely jump in as we continue our series this year on commercial builder multifamily. Um, and so again, you can go back and watch any of our previous shows if you're interested in residential or multifamily, healthcare, long-term care, government. We've covered a lot of different segments, but this is our hospitality segment. So before we jump in though, I wanna introduce our guests for today. We have some great guests with us. Um, so first I wanna introduce uh, Shelly Ackerman with Taylor. She's joining us remotely. Shelly, thanks for being here. Good morning, Seth. Thanks for having me on. Of course. Um, and Shelly, do you mind just telling us a little bit about, I know you're, you're uh, fairly new to Taylor and we're so glad you're here with us, but do you mind telling us a little bit about your background in the industry? <coughs> I'd be happy to. Thanks again. Um, so I recently joined Taylor in June of this year after spending 22 years in the commercial market segment working for a major flooring manufacturer and uh, before that was a or am a certified interior designer so taking everything that i've known and um, experienced on the commercial segment and parlaying that now into adhesives working with the commercial buying groups and flooring contractors awesome and shelly uh like i said great to have you here and we're we're interested to hear some of the questions that you'll have and some of the input you'll have on today's uh on today's episode um, also joining me remotely is Robert Varden with CFI. Robert, thanks for being here. Hey, Seth. How you doing? Hello, Shelly. Good morning. Good morning. Well, as you know, CFI, it's pretty easy. We're a 28-year-old association of floor covering installers, uh, training, education, and certification. And obviously now, I think, in the last several years, uh, trying to figure out why kids haven't gotten in the trade and uh, obviously doing a lot on the recruiting side of the business at this point in time. But no, I love yeah. being on the show, and you guys, uh, you, do, you did a great job, Seth. Yeah, thank you. Longstanding guest, Robert. Great to have you back, as always. And uh, really exciting today, actually joining me in studio, um, we have Kim Droughts. I hope I said that correctly. You did. <laughs> uh, who is president of hospitality with Tarquette. Kim, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. It's good to be here. Yeah, it's great to have you in studio. Rarely do we get guests in studio with us, especially <laughs> through COVID, so it's nice to... Nice to be coming back to it's an old world. It's good to be here yeah. live. <laughs> yeah, for sure. So Kim, do you mind telling us just a little bit, just just walk me through a little bit of your background, your experience. I know you have a, a wealth of knowledge and experience in the hospitality industry. Sure. So yeah. talk to us a little bit about that. Yeah, I spent the first part of my career in uh, flooring sales. Uh, I was really uh, dedicated to the hospitality sector at that point um, early in my career, so in the late 90s. From there, I um, joined uh, Mohawk Industries okay. and, and in the Durkin division, their hospitality division, and spent 13 really great years with them mm -hmm. and um, moved from, you know, management into to, into senior leadership. And from there, I, I left and decided to join the hotel ranks themselves and went into hotel operations and ran um, the operations for a, a small boutique chain out of the okay. Midwest and uh, we had 15 hotels in five states wow and yeah learned a lot that yeah. was a, an incredible education into people um, into hot hotel operations themselves and you know everything from the guest experience to uh, development and then from there moved to where i'm at today which is tarquette hospitality and i run the business for tarquette in the hospitality business unit so awesome yeah well that's quite a resume so <laughs> we're, we're like i said we're excited to have you here Thank you. Um, and, and with that being said, that's a perfect segue into actually uh, jump starting into our Hospitality Horizon segment. So, um, so let's, uh, let's, let's kind of start with, Kim, can you paint us a picture of what's happened in the hospitality world in the last, call it 18 months, through COVID, supply chain, some of these yeah. things? Uh, you've heard what you've heard in the news and what you've, you know, a lot of segments have been experiencing um, has really been just a decimation, if you will, of the, of mm. the sector. We, um, people pulled completely back in March of last year and just quit traveling. Yeah. And uh, we were, um, 
watching this closely with our business partners. You know, we work a lot with the major franchises, so Hilton, Marriott, and you know, all, all Wyndham Choice, all the all the the major franchises, and really listening and keeping our ear very close to what they were doing with their ownership. Right. And then we work very closely with ownership and and what we call FF and E, which is furniture, fixtures, and equipment. And mm. in in the hotel world, there's there's FF and E, and the, there's OS and E. So you have operational supplies and equipment, and then you have FF and E. And, and FF and E is where flooring okay. uh, really happens, and really anything that um, goes into a, a hotel project is considered FF and E. So we we were we're very close to that group of of buyers as well. And what we saw was just an, an incredible, just stopping of the market. And then it became a game mm -hmm. of when will people travel again? And re really yeah. trying to put your finger on the pulse of, do owners and developers have money and, and funds and capital funds to go ahead and renovate during a time when they should? When I operated hotels, when we wanted to renovate anything from a guest room or whether it could have been a public space or a, um, you know, a, a meeting space, it became a game of the calendar, right? Finding time when yep. nobody was going to be there, or when we could squeeze in a quick install, and um, so now, you know, last year we had all this time, ownership had all this time in their hands, but did they didn't really have the funds to go ahead and, right. and make those capital improvements because they were just using all the, all their funds and everything they could just to keep the hotel running and paying their people. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, it was just, it's been a, a rough year and um, we're starting to see, as you've probably seen, the airlines started, we, we track very closely the airline right. travel because usually yeah. hotel travel will uh, follow what the airlines do and leisure travel came back. It was a big year for, or big summer for, for hoteliers. Um, the issue became labor. Hmm. Finding okay. people to work, yeah, and um, you know, people, the labor force went somewhere. We're not exactly sure where, <laughs> right? Um, but they they decided to find different jobs outside of <coughs> hospitality, and, and hospitality for us can is more than just hotels, yeah. right? It's bars and restaurants, and um, and those jobs just um, are still there, and people we still have to fill them. Yeah. And if you ask ownership today, th their biggest challenge right now is labor. I think I heard at a conference a couple weeks ago, labor is up almost fourteen. percent um, yeah. in in terms of how they're having to you know manage their properties and, and finding people and you know if you've traveled I don't know if you've traveled recently but yep. there's a there's a um, if you when you check in you'll probably get asked do you need we're not doing stay stay right. over service Seth yep. would you like you know if you need stay over service you're gonna have to tell us yep. because housekeeping isn't coming into your room anymore yeah. um, on night two or yeah or they don't even give you a I was just in New York and they don't even give you a choice they just say they we just don't. Say, it's not happening. Yeah, it's yeah. not happening. Yeah. So if you need sheets or pillows or blankets or towels or whatever, you <laughs> Call let the us front know. Desk. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. yeah, it's a thing. It's labor's really. You know, a, that, that's a interesting thing. to hear, Kim. Yeah. Uh, it, I got a question for you, Kim, because you know I was traveling back for services and I I pulled into it twice. This happened to me, and it got into a situation where and, and I'm talking with your hoteliers. I'm I'm curious. You know, I, I pull up to this hotel and the parking lot is like literally empty. I mean, I'm looking, I'm thinking, oh, yeah, piece of cake. I'll be able to get a room here. And I go in and they're sold out. And and that happened suddenly again at another hotel, at another hotel. And then somebody said, well, it's not so much that they don't have the rooms, that they didn't have the staff to clean the rooms. Yeah, we put, we, that, we call that OOO. You just put them out of order because hmm. you don't have enough staffing to put people in the rooms so it's showing online as sold out hmm. yeah or, wow. or when you call That's... the hotel directly yeah it's it's sure. a real problem you know right behind i think right behind labor um challenges i think if you were to ask ownership today they'd tell you that the the second thing is we're waiting for that business traveler to come back yeah because leisure travel right. when i was running hotels the leisure traveler is as your, they're they're your weekend warriors, right? right? They're probably the hardest uh, people on a hotel in terms of, um, you know, whether it be housekeeping or maintaining, and uh, they they use all parts of the hotel. Yeah. All the kids use all parts yep. of the hotel, and so um, it's not the leisure travel is traveler in, for us wasn't really um, the the biggest revenue stream. The biggest revenue stream was on the back of that corporate traveler that's coming right. in maybe Sunday night or Monday through Thursday. And they rarely use their room. They, you know, they're, they're just great. They're the customer where yeah. you build, you know, you build all your business. Yeah, for sure. So.
Hmm. Yeah, it is. It is interesting. How well, let me ask you this, Kim. How much it's changed? Go ahead, Robert. I'm sorry, Seth. <laughs> you know, I, I think we I mentioned this to you earlier. Sometimes defining that what what is actually hospitality. You know, when you look at it, especially like say for Tarket, do you find that as the just the hotels and their chains? I mean, or is it also the restaurants, the bars? I mean, do you kind of group all that into what you would consider hospitality? Largely, we consider hospitality hotels. Um, anymore, the lines are really blurred. Now, I'll say bars and restaurants, industry-wide, they're absolutely hospitality. That is considered one and the same. Um, but for us, the lines get blurred a little into senior living uh, mm. uh, because hot senior living developers are developing those properties to look, act, and feel like a major resort. So that's more of where the blurred lines are coming for us. We're really clear on hospitality in terms of it being a hotel or a bar or a restaurant. Um, but, the, but the more of that, that challenge for us is how do we segment senior living today? Because right. that's such a, a similar um, property in, in terms of, or development in terms, or segment in terms of being like hospitality. Yeah. And I do want to remind That's our viewers, I, I forgot to mention earlier, but if you're, if you're watching and have questions live, we'd love to field those. You can text those to the number right there. Also, if you look in the description um, at the bottom of where you're watching, there will be a text in number uh, that's that same one. So feel free to text your questions in live. You can ask them to specific people that are on the show today or just in general. Um, we're happy to field those. So sorry to interrupt there. Um, but Robert, did you have another question? Yeah, I did. I know. Again, you know, we it was odd. Of course, I, I was still traveling a little bit during COVID, and I think I was be I would be one of three or four guests in the entire hotel, and it was very different, you know. And and of course, that seems to, like you said, changed a lot in the last you know two three months, especially over the summer. I bet but, you, you noticed know, a big if, change if in F and B, like food and beverage. Did you notice a big change when you right. were traveling yeah. in that sector or yeah. in that part of the yeah. business? Because F and B really took. You know, so so guests like you and me, I've been traveling since last July. I really didn't stop. Um, I, you, right. you, you come to the hotel, you expect to have a place to eat yep. or have a, a cocktail or a drink after work. Yep. And um, a lot of times those have been completely shut down or, or closed altogether. Yeah. And yeah. the hotel is now just a place to sleep. Yeah. So. yeah. I mean, I know we, we were we were down in Orlando with CFI uh, convention and it was a Rosen Shingle Resort, you know, beautiful resort. They've got all these restaurants and, and coffee shop and all that. Coffee shop closed at 2. Yeah. So it was like, you know, I, the, the first day I made the mistake, I got there like 2.05. So. <laughs> but, yeah, it is, it's so bizarre because you're used to just everything being open. You get what you want when you want. You get room service. You get whatever. And, and it's very different now. It's so. not, and, it was, and from an operator's well, standpoint, it's not, just a, it's not just a game of trying to – to to not pay you know not have enough to pay people to come to work it's actually finding the people yeah. to come to work because i'm sure you would have oh, paid yeah. an extra buck for that cup of coffee yep. you, you know just to have been able to have the shop open when you needed it to be yeah. open so it's a, it's a it's a difficult climate yeah. right now well and i th i think we saw those changes everywhere i know you know of course kind of like probably yourself when we fly around all the time we get upgraded up to first class and you know, you sit down for a three or four hour flight. They usually bring you, a, you know, a drink and a nice meal. And now I get a bag of pretzels and a plastic cup. Yep. <laughs> but I, I will say the last few flights, I've even seen some of the meals and everything start to come back. But yeah, one of the questions sorry. I had, I know I, I saw, you know, I was curious. And, and you answered that question is if the owners did take that time to do, you know, some of the needed remodels here and there. But it sounds like they thought they would just hunker down and, and, and wait. But from the standpoint of remodel versus new construction, I know in my area in Rockwall, we've seen a lot of little, you know, hotels pop up, little Hiltons, little Marriott's, things like that. Um, what, what do you see as your, you know, percentages of new construction versus remodel? Yeah, it's 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 rather robust. It gives you when I were when we were looking at the number. It's budget season, right? So we're all, we're already looking at numbers and what renovation and new construction is looking like for us. And um, we subscribe to Build Central and Lodging Econometrics, two very formidable uh, leaders in in giving you know a, a snapshot in the landscape of what's happening in the construction world for hotels. 
that that banks wanted to complete those deals, right? So they're they're very motivated to get those properties open and running in some way. Um, the con new construction pipeline is still rather robust for 2022 and 2023. Um, what we're seeing though is franchise from a renovation standpoint though, from franchises are still giving what they call PIP. Um, they have these PIPs that they met, met, they ask ownership to. Um, you know, redo their hotel to try to bring it up to, to, to franchise standards. Right. Those PIPs, they're still forgiving, um, it, at least in the short term. We don't, we see that changing next year. Once they start to really enforce those PIPs, I think that renovation cycle is, is going to start picking up. Hmm. Um, the new construction, some are moving, some are not. Those, like I said, banks are, are interested in getting those properties open and running. But if ownership has a chance, you know, supply chain has been right. so hard on this sector right now. And, 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 and once supply chain starts to alleviate, we'll, we'll start to see more new construction projects really happen probably pretty fast. Hmm. Um, but, uh, you know, there's, there's chain scales that are, that are the most active right now. And those are the ones that, um, that you would see. It's like the leisure driven classes, those economy, um, mid scale, um, you know, maybe upper mid scale, the family hotels, right. those are open and really running fairly well. It's the, it's the luxury class where you, where you host large meetings, right. where the large meetings still aren't really happening for the most part right now. Um, those are the ones that are experiencing the most um, in terms of impact, in terms of revenue. Yeah. And um, so, you know, it's, it's been an, an interesting uh, journey the last 12 months. Hospitality is measured on RevPAR, so that's revenue per available room. And it's, it's been a game of, um, you know, occupancy um, versus ADR. So ADR is average daily rate. So right. um, it's always been really driven um, by occupancy. And, and now the shift has, has we, what we've seen it is, it's all being driven by, um, by ADR right now. Yeah. Your hotels, I mean, you've been traveling. Your hotel, I'm guessing, isn't any less than it was when you stopped traveling pre-COVID, oh, no. it's actually probably it's more. more. Yeah. So this, this recovery in that, in that uh, leisure sector is really happening on the back of ADR. So right. those of us are gonna pay the rate because we need to find a place to yeah. stay. Um, occupancy still isn't, isn't you know, where we see it to be. Yeah. And, we, and, and everybody in the industry is very optimistic it's returning, it's gonna return with a vengeance, yeah. um, but it's probably not gonna be until 2024 before we start to see any real change in uh, what we call pre-pandemic levels. We're, we're, our measuring stick is 2019. It was really the pinnacle um, for hospitality in general of being the, one of the best years ever. Mm. And so when we measure against 2019, we're looking out to 2024, that's when, Pretty much everybody expects that it be it come back hmm. fully. Okay. So, Kim, I, Kim one other question. I know. Does do you so, see so from the you? hotel owners? Uh, I'm sorry, Shelly. Well, she, <laughs> Shelly That's okay. Shelly, we'll get to your question in ha in just a second. Go ahead, Robert. Do you see the the hotels as far as where they might be focusing their their money as far as do you think it's, you know, because obviously it, when I go to the hotel chains, you know, I can stay at a, you know, an economical hotel or, a, you know, they got the mid-level and then they got the, you know, the nicer, big, large, you know, five-store jobs. Do you see an area that they're maybe focusing on more than others at this point in time? Yeah, I do. Um, they're, they're putting a lot of money in technology. And what we're seeing, and that's not surprising to me having... Um, been on the operation side of hotels. Uh, I, I went through a, a technology renovation in, in that chain, in, my, in that hotel chain um, that was just so necessary. But then COVID um, and, and really allowed for a, the need to be even greater. So when you're in, when you're on a hotel, you have systems and, and all these system, the PMS system runs the front desk. This system runs security. This system <coughs> runs Wi-Fi. you know? So right. it, it, there's, there's a whole sort of generation of technology upgrades that are happening right now that I think ownership are really um, focusing on um, in terms of getting all those systems integrated into Maybe one. I don't know. I hmm. think that's the future. Okay. But I think that's where they're pouring a lot of their money in is is into uh, technology. And I, I know that I would be putting a lot of my available capital in that bucket as well. 
Um, what we are trying to figure out is when, as, as hospitality or, or travelers start to come back, business travel starts to come back, when does that really translate into like flooring dollars, right? right? When does that make the most sense for, um, or the most impact to my business or, or any other, a dealer's business, you know, installation. So, um, uh, but I, I think to answer your question, Robert, it's, it's all about technology right now. Hmm. And Shelly, go ahead, you had a question? I did. So, you know, the technology piece is certainly very interesting. I wouldn't have necessarily thought of that. I was thinking more along the lines of kind of attracting that business traveler and or the family traveler, trying to get them back into your property. How does the FF and E spend look? Because everyone's competing for that same person that's now all of a sudden feeling comfortable with traveling. And how do the different chains differentiate that? So maybe you answered part of my question with the technology piece, if that's really important to a traveler, be it business or pleasure, or then, you know, again, on the decor and services side, what does that look like, Kim? You know, even pre-COVID, I think everybody wants to stay at a fresh product. You know, you want to walk in, you want to see a fresh guest room, fresh yep. design, you know, and, um, you know, you want it to be renovated. And so I think there is, that's never going to go away. The renovation cycle, sadly, mo was every five to six years. So you would, as an owner, you would say, okay, in, in year five or year four, I got to start planning for a refresh of my guest rooms, maybe my public space too, but definitely my guest rooms. Um, maybe my restaurant, you know, but you would start planning a renovation of some kind in, in your in your four to, to be done in year five or six. That's moved out now and, mm. and ownership is re renovating at what we're seeing as maybe eight and nine years. Mm. So I think it's almost double. It's almost double. We, I don't think it's going to be that way forever, but it, right now that's what we're seeing in, in terms of a renovation cycle. Mm. What what I do think, though, is how they compete, Shelley, is I think they're competing with the images of the hotel and, and, and what they can offer because it, they, you can't buy you know, um, a demand, right? You can't, right. I, you can't buy demand. You can't create demand. All you can do is, is try to create demand for, for your product in terms of taking market share from somebody else. Mar the market is going to come back as the market wants to come back. You just have to figure out how much of that market you can take. And it's, it's, um, we think pictures sell. Uh, so, uh, it, it, whether you're a hotel owner or a developer, I think you got to have a really strong social game. Right. And um, I think you have to be have a compelling reason for people to want to stay, and that is usually an image of a very clean hotel. Um, I think kind of people are maybe a little tired of hearing how you have no touch surfaces or no no ch no touch check in at the. Fr people want to see yeah, people, yeah. <laughs> and I think yeah, so. Sure. There's 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 a little bit of of that game going on, but I think generally um, it's going to be about the the look and the feel of the property when you walk in. Right. And the brand, everybody has their favorite brand and um, and you know th their favorite points they like to go after. And so I think once right. you know that you wanna go after your Marriott points, your Hilton points, you're just gonna start to pick your property from there. And, um, but yeah, I think it's all about, um, all about cleanliness and, and the freshness and, and the appeal of the property, in my opinion. Hmm. Thanks, Kim. Any, any other questions that you had, Shelly? Or did that get you? Um, I just had another one. I don't know if we want to go there yet, but I'm going to ask it. So, you okay, know, talking about <laughs> um, <laughs> talking about um, finishes and materials and, you know, as we're talking to owners of properties, trying to get them to um, up their spend as they're refreshing, maybe can you chat a little bit about some of the supply chain challenges that we've been living in? So, you know, you have a property owner that says, okay, I'm going to use this time to freshen a common area or a guest room and then, oh, oh, by the way, you know, we have, you know, all of these stoppages going on. Has that affected, I guess, the spend within a particular hospitality segment to say, you know, that's great that you want to do it, but maybe you can't do it. So we're going to put that off and do something else. It, it has an impact, supply chain has impacted everything that these hotel ownerships are going through. And us too as suppliers, right? Yeah. So um, yes, I, I heard an, anecdotally, I was, I heard a story a couple weeks ago where uh, an owner was, was developing a property, brand new construction, 
and uh, got the budgets or got the bids in and to, you know to get his case goods a lot of a, a lot of items that are finishing out a hotel guest room do come from Asia and so lighting uh, uh, case goods which is you know your nightstands your night tables your bed your you know your bed headboards and, and dressers and things like that plumbing you know just name it and he he got the bid for his case goods and the the cost to bring the case goods in was more than the actual cost of the case goods wow and he literally just put his pen down and said I'm, we're we're not building right now yeah. we're going to put this on hold until this gets figured out so it is impacting um it impacts me i make carpet right here in the united states right so yeah. so why not just you know go ahead and and recarpet or, or keep the project on on the rails in terms of what you can get here. It doesn't work that way. You know, mm. they don't want to put a carpet into a hotel room when the case goods, you know, you know, are going to be six to twelve months out. Right. You know, and so or, or more. It's yeah. in many cases. So it's it's supply chain has really impacted um, development, and and it, it's all about cost per key. Shelly, you asked me that, like, why can't we, can we get them to just spend a little bit more money and just put put a put a you know a little bit better product, maybe that we make right here in the United States, in and and not have to wait on something that's coming from overseas? Yes and no. I mean, I I, t I try to convince them that uh, myself all the time, but I think that when I when you know they're trying to make a profit and they have to build this property, um, you know for a certain cost per key and franchises promise them that they'll be able to build it for a certain amount and so when you when you introduce a product that's suddenly you know maybe 20 or 30 percent higher than what they thought they were going to be it it seems like an easy decision but it's it's really not it's it's a challenge to um to get a return on that investment when you when you're not keeping your cost per key in yeah. check well and then finding labor to install it too is that's the second big part of yeah. that. It's not just products and you know materials. It's it's the labor to do right. it. And Robert knows this better than anything. You know, part of my challenge yeah. as a hotel owner was finding a qualified installation crew to to put whether it be LVT in the bathrooms or whether it be LVT in the guest rooms or whether right. it be you know ceramic tile in the bar or what, whatever carpet. It didn't matter. It was just always a challenge and a game to find. Um, installers and that was pre-COVID. It yeah. has gotten exponentially worse yeah. uh, since then, and so it's, it's, um, it's. I would say, you know, from a from a, a, a dealer or an installer's perspective, what we have done, and I, my my recommendation would be uh, back to to that group of folks is to really focus on the management companies. Hmm. Um, there are management companies and developers that own hundreds of properties. Sure, and they're they're. There's always something going on, pre-COVID or COVID. There's always something going on, and when you can really get in and get drive the relationship and be someone they can trust and yeah. vice versa, you're going to start to you can be 20 to 30 percent higher on install costs than maybe the next guy, but because you're dependable and you can install it with with no headaches for that ownership because that's all they yeah. want is they just want to get through it without a headache. Yep then you're going to be a very valuable resource to that owner. Yeah. That so, so speaking of that, Kim, let's talk a little bit about, um, and definitely Robert, I want to pull you in on this too, but let's talk about um, some of the flooring, you know, challenges that you see in hotels. I mean, we were, you were just talking about that, right? Sometimes you're trying to install LVT in a room or a, or a bathroom or, you know, ceramic tile or broad loom, and you've got these crazy patterns in ballrooms and meeting rooms and all this stuff. So. Let's talk a little bit about the flooring that goes into hospitality um, and some of the challenges related to that. So Robert, actually, I'm going to kind of start off with you. Um, I know you've got a little bit of experience with installing some carpet. So, so uh, just a so little what, bit. What do you see in um, in some of the challenges? And then, Kim, we're going to rely on you to talk about some of the product um, changes, what we're expecting to see and all that as well. Yeah. Well, obviously, again, you start talking the higher end hotels, you start talking the ballrooms. Uh, you know, most of my career, that's that's really where I lived. Really, you know, traveled around the country, around the world with, you know, large projects, large patterned projects, double stick ballrooms, woven materials, Axminsters. And yeah, suddenly <clears throat> you took a an industry that was already in desperate need of your average installer to go out and do a base grade product in a three bedroom home 
now if you take and you need a guy that that's like okay you're looking for a nurse and now suddenly you need a surgeon okay there's far less of those so obviously finding those and those that can do it well is much much harder to do um and i did have a you know when when you talk categories we had I was kind of curious too, Kim, because you know, just about every segment we've done on the commercial side of the business, we've seen those category changes. You know, we've gotten we've gotten away from a lot of you know carpet in a lot of areas, and and I will say, I stayed actually it was a Hilton property too. Now, granted, it wasn't a real high end Hilton property, but it was a Hilton property, and I was surprised when I saw LVT in the guest room, and uh, you know something. <clears throat> so my question would be, are you seeing those? product category changes come about as LVT is suddenly conquering the world and does that also especially being at Tarquette you know obviously if you put carpet in a room it never wears out it uglies out and they got to replace it you know LVT on the other hand suddenly I would think wow the life cycle's a lot longer I may not sell it as often does that yeah that all comes into play we I think the Kager for LVT is something crazy like seven or eight percent um i haven't i haven't looked at it in, in a minute but i it, but what we know is it's growing in hospitality a lot um but so is carpet tile too so we didn't yeah. see that one coming either um broad loom uh is is typically what ownership would often choose for it for inside their guest room it's a lot less expensive than LVT and, and carpet tile. Um, so, you know, I don't ever see rolled goods going away. I think that's always gonna be a thing. But, but, but Robert, you're right. I mean, Hilton has been a little bit slower to come back in, with LVT and guest rooms. Marriott's been doing it for a long time yeah. and, um, you know, has, has, has really um, kind of led the way in terms of the major franchises inside the guest room. The problem with guest room and LVT as I see it, uh, as an ownership, is, is the sound. Right, so it's got to have high IIC. It's got to have dampening. You don't want to hear it in the room below with somebody's right. walking across in their high heels, or you know, so or the kids are jumping. And so um, it's 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 more now for for hospitality ownership and 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 product people like us to develop uh, products that can go in a guest room that are, have high IIC, that the costs are still low enough that they can get that return on their cost per key. Um, that has ready, readily available supply. Um, you were, were talking about the renovation cycle, Robert. Like, you know, carpet uglies out. You're right. It's, it, you, I could throw it out an I-75 and for 10 years and nothing would happen to it. But, but, but people will just change it because it gets ugly and it's time for a refresh. And that's right. what America wants. I mean, that's what the traveler wants. They want a fresh product. Um, LVT, you know, I, I, we used to clean that in the hotel. It would, I, you know, <laughs> labor ratio was the game I always used to play. And how long does it take to, to take my housekeeping department to clean uh, a, a guest room? If I can cut two or three minutes out of that cleaning process, I, I've gained something. That's yeah. meaningful. Those are meaningful numbers. And you can clean LVT and you can get it to look clean. It's perceived cleaner, yeah. you know, than carpet. Yeah. So, um, so there's that, but you're right. It's not going to wear out. It's it's just going to be like carpet, right? It's just not going to wear out. It's going to be somebody's going to get tired of the wood look because that's what everybody's putting in, right? It's that typical wood look. Yep. They're going to want to go to something new. We're starting to see some really fun designs in LVT that um, are moving out of the wood looks and going into more like linen looks or just different looks. Um, and so I think it's going to be that same game of like, okay, it's not worn out. Could we do another year, five years? Sure, it's not going to, nothing's wrong with it. Um, but they're going to rip it out because um, they, they want to just put something fresh and new in. So um, that's why guest rooms are typically stretched in because you can rip those out f pretty fast. And we're seeing click LVT being the, the, the product of choice for guest rooms because you can rip that out pretty fast. So if you glue something down, it becomes much more difficult to remove at the time you do want to do that refresh and, and your you know, ownership is trying to plan down that road a little bit. But right. it's not to say that there's not glue down going in in, in guest rooms. There, there are. It's just I think we're, we're seeing a trend in more of a click, click product. But then also right. one of our challenges is, you know, rugs are big in guest rooms now. And so how okay. sometimes the rugs that sit on top of the LVT and sometimes it's carpet tile or rugs that are inset within the square of the LVT under the bed. And um, 
And the transition from carpet to LVT is always a challenge, you know, making that transition less. Right. Ownership, franchise, they all want, they don't want to have to buy that extra transition. They just want, you know, the fewer products you can get, the better. So we're all now sort of innovating around what's, how does that transitionless um, flow look in a guest room and really addressing those. And then water is always a concern, right? Yep. You get out of the bathtub and, and when I was, uh, we built a hotel in, in Kansas City back in 2015, and um, we chose a we chose an LVT product for the bathrooms, and um, it was bad. It was we, we, at that time it wasn't waterproof, and we didn't know it, and so we had all these things starting to come up around the shower, and oh my gosh, then you know, 18 months later, I'm ripping it all out and right. I'm putting in ceramic tile. Now it's changed. There are there there are waterproof. LVTs that are really game changing and for ownership to use in the bathroom areas and the wet areas. So yeah. it's working out. Yeah, and you see a lot more of those like the open showers almost where mm -hmm. it's like a half glass door, but then the rest of it's just open. just open. Yeah. So right yeah, wa the yep, water's going to get out there <laughs> yep. for sure. Yeah, absolutely. So um, we did actually get a question in um, kind of related to what we're talking about, but uh, what trends are you seeing with flooring products, both in hotel rooms and in the public spaces? So I think we're talking about the rooms right now. Yeah. Um, but let's bring that to public spaces. What What are you seeing as far as as trends with that? So there is. We're not seeing anything in terms of um, from a product category. Axminster has a a place in hospitality that we just don't see going away. It it it's equated with a level of luxury and performance that hoteliers have come to know and want and a and d are, are the same the same way they want they want axminster um but what we're also seeing is that they they also want large designs and and big designs and and large scale you know opportunities to mul with multiple breadths that you can create one large design within a hotel ballroom for instance right. So we, we don't see any of that going away, uh, but we what, what we do see is that there might be a, well not might, there is a trend coming for uh, us to be able to make, the, the suppliers to be able to make those large scale designs here in the U.S. Hmm. Almost all of the Axminster um, that, that hospitality uses and specifies are plants in Belgium. Okay. There are other plants. They're all over the world: China and India and Turkey, and and so there's there's an appetite to how can we make Axminster in the U.S. Right. And we'd love to figure that out and love to innovate around that. It's a it's not really even about the manufacturing process. It's really for us more about wool and getting pro, you know getting wool and yarn and hmm. and all that processing here. It's just just done better. Um, you know, uh, in, for us, it's, uh, Belgium is a fantastic place. It, it's in Dendermont. That's where our plant is, and it just it's we use fine Scottish wool, and you know, we we wouldn't want to change that because Axminster right. kind of drives that sort of luxury, and you need you need good product. But what we see is more um, of our uh, our partners in in equipment making equipment that can make beautiful large scale designs in nylon. Hmm. And that's what, you know, I think the industry is going to really kind of be going after, even casinos. And casinos typically use, will use an Axminster because of, you know, the smoke, this, it doesn't, it has this low, wool has a low burn rate. So it's typically always used in a, in a casino. But, um, but so I think from that perspective, I think we're just going to see large scales continue, bright colors continue. Um, but we, we, I think we're going to see a, a little bit of a shift moving into nylon instead of hmm. wool. So what about like, I, I see this some places, um, and, and I'm trying to think uh, if I see it much in hospitality, but like the, the LVT being used on walls, like accent walls or even guest room walls. Um, is that something you're seeing happening or? I'm not. Uh, usually fire codes prevent those kind of things from happening. Um, outside of putting it on the floor, putting something on the wall has a complete, goes a completely different direction. Right. I do think there's going to be some innovation there, Seth, where we're going to start to see some of those opportunities um, where we're going to innovate product that, that will pass fire code and will be able to be used on the wall. A um, lot of opportunity there, I think, um, in terms of, 
you know, we what what we're, we we make wall base too, right? So right. it's just a little bit yep, higher, and we're gonna higher. do yeah. we're gonna do it. So yeah. we're gonna figure it out. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, because then you're moving that flooring product up off the off the floor, but it also looks really good. You it know, does. We, and we see it in restaurants and, yeah. you yeah. know, and they'll put real wood and stuff too, but. A lot of design appeal. AD loves those kind yeah. of innovative um, guest room of the future. We talk a lot about that. I'm on a couple of panels about what does that look like, being able to walk into a room and step on a place, you know, in uh, on the carpet or the LVT and it turns on all your lights and just things like that, you know, mm -hmm. where it's, um, um, where we're starting to see just a different, different, you know, focus in the guest room yeah. and, and to our earlier conversation about technology, you know, and, yeah. and that kind of thing. Yeah, sorry about that. We had a, uh, a, a phone ringing in the, stu in the studio. That just leads me to my, yeah, sorry, well, hey, Kim, that leads me to my next question. Like, who is the major influencer when it comes to um, hotel chains or even some of the boutique chains? Is it A&D? Is it the owner has a stronger voice? Is it you as the manufacturer's rep? What role you know, do each of those parts play within the specification process? We all like to think we play a really important part in all of that. Um, I, I think at the end of the day, uh, it's, it's for us, it's about relationship and having the relationships with the right people. And, in, in, you know, it's so interesting. When I left um, Mohawk in 2013 and joined, it, went to join the hotel chain, um, I, I, I kind of stayed away from those industry events that I was going to uh, before. And I, I was really focused on operations. I was focused on big data, you know, who was my customer and, and really just trying to understand, you know, how to operate a hotel. When I came back in 2019, one of my first things I did at Tarquette was was go to an, an industry event called HD Summit hmm. and it's Hospitality Design Summit. And it gets all of the, the really the, the who's who of hospitality design together in a room with suppliers. And, um, and we, I saw the same 400 people I saw six years <laughs> earlier. It right. was crazy. So there's, I like, I, I, it, <clears throat> it's great because we can focus on these same, we, these 400 customers. We know who they are. They right. really aren't changing. Some are joining other firms and some are kind of, you know, merging. But at the end of the day, they're all the same. And, and, and so it, it, it allows us to be really focused on who we're calling. We have a very focused strategy um, in my organization. And it's, it's, it's three, three things that we're focused on. And it's, it's very focused around A and D, Shelley, because they are big in making decisions for ownership. Ownership hires these, these firms to really take and make their property something extremely unique. And um, and these group of this group of AND, some of the most talented, best people I've ever met in my life, um, have really just changed the game for it. Can change the game for an owner in terms of really just developing a, an, an off the charts type of property that that the, the luxury traveler, when we have meet business meetings again, will want to go and, and have a meeting at this site. So I think Shelley, I think it's A and D, um, and then I think you, we've got to be really, really, really close to ownership. Um, there's a lot of mergers and acquisitions in that sector or in that uh, group as well. There, there, um, there's deals happening out there. There's, um, I, I know refinancing is starting to pick up. I think there's some some stressed assets sitting sitting out there. They're not so stressed that they're willing to sell for for nothing yet. But right. I think um, I think some of that might be coming in in the next six to twelve months too. So those those ownership groups are are um, very influential in that buying process. You know, they, they will say to the A&D firm that they hire, hey, you, you, know, you can pick your suppliers. You, I, just wanted, I just want you to you know, develop or you know, design me the most beautiful hotel that you can. And, but some will come in and say, design me the most beautiful hotel that you can, but we want you to use this supplier and this supplier and this supplier right. because we have a relationship there and they have proven to us that they'll, they'll deliver product on time and on budget. Right. So, um, so they're as, as equally influential in my mind as. Yeah, and speaking of that kind of picking, you know, picking suppliers that they want to work with, how, how does, this is another question we got, um, how does Tarquette or in, any other su flooring supplier, but for you Tarquette, uh, differentiate themselves in, in today's market? It's, for, for us, it's about their people. And we really rely uh, really heavily on our people to represent our product. And we have, um, we spend a lot of time and a lot of resources 
making sure we have the right people doing the right things at the right time for the right reasons. Mm. And uh, we, we're, we're a relationship-based company. And uh, yeah, we, we, we make product and I got to prove an EBITDA at the end of the day, um, but we are people-based and I think that for us differenti differentiates ourselves from the competitor. You know, at the, at the end of the day, we all make product. Yeah. We all have carpet, we all have LVT, we all have, you know, the, the similar products and, and it's, it's, it's our people. And, and I think it's our design too. Yeah. We have an incredible design department that just tries to stay fresh on trend, coming out with the most, you know, beautiful designs. That's what captures A and D's attention. Yeah. You know, it's those it's that the ability to take a picture or a design and catapult off of that and make it their own. And yeah. I think our design department is just um, very influential for us in, in making, in differentiating us in the, in the flooring sure. market. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and we've seen, I mean, the last even even few years, but five, six, seven years of, of resilient products has changed the world, literally. Yes, so, it really has. Yeah, it, it <laughs> has for sure. Um, and, uh, and and I think, you know, as, as we as we keep talking, I know we've touched on it some, but I would love to kind of, in, unless Shelley to Robert, do you have any questions here before we kind of move into into future trends? Well, I was I was kind of curious, and maybe it's a future trend. I don't know, but you know, when you asked her about Tarquette, you had mentioned earlier, Ken, that uh, again the the lines seem to be getting more and more blurred between hospitality and assisted living. Well, I know we we did a segment on assisted living, and and one of the things that shocked me that I heard was the lack of it that we had. I mean, I think, you know, when they looked at the numbers, I don't remember, Seth, maybe you recall, but we only had 30% or whatever of what was actually needed in that segment, you know, the industry. And, yeah. and so obviously, when you look at that, I mean, we're all gonna grow older. You know, that's not a choice. Staying at a hotel and traveling is a choice. So I didn't know if in your position there in hospitality, if you were looking at that and if, you know, we are peeling back those layers really um, intently right now, Robert. We're just uh, very interested in what is happening in senior living. We, we've heard from a lot of our major A&D firms that they, are, they had to take on senior living projects during 2020 just to you know keep their doors open and, yeah. and, and keep designing things. And senior living didn't really miss a beat. Uh, developing didn't and so when hospitality started to laggard people were trying to find ways to stay busy and they really launched into what we what we saw as senior living and so I think that is here to stay I think we're gonna see a lot of those blurred lines continue and we're very interested at Tarquette on how um, and on the products that we have for that market and uh, how we can really better be a better partner because I think there's all, there, all this major supply, all of us are, are in it in some way, you right. know, right? So we've, we're, we all have a play in it. Some, some manufacturers have a lot bigger share of that market than others. Um, but I, I think for us, it's, it's, we're gonna rely on some pretty big data to just get us the information we need and understanding. I, I looked at a number, Robert, that uh, this has probably been 60 days ago about the senior living development that's happening uh, in 2022. And it is unreal, yep. the growth that we're seeing in that. And, and like I said, it's just so similar to what we're seeing in hospitality in terms of products that we know we can get there. We just have to tweak some things and add some things and really, get some voice of customer around what we're, what we, we're not seeing yeah. or what we don't know. Um, so we, we tend all the big trade events. And interestingly, you know, one, one of our uh, customers, H Hospitality Design, Emerald Expo, is, there, is, is they're, they're owned by Emerald Expo. They, they now um, own uh, the rights to uh, many of the senior living shows. Hmm. And so, and those are starting to fold in under uh, hospitality. Yeah. So we're even, now I'm getting, I'm getting pinged uh, uh, being a part of um, those shows and those events and those trade, 
trade environments and um, it seems to make sense, right? Yeah. So, because we have, we, we seem to already already do it. So yeah. why not, you know, be, be a part of that? And, and Tarquette Commercial has has always been a part of those. It's just now how to, figuring out how to bring hospitality products together with our really, in, in, you know, great hero products in the commercial se segment and marrying those up to right. address the segment. Well, because you do, you have a lot of crossover, I feel like, mm -hmm. when it comes to, you know, senior living and hospitality because you have, there's rooms and there's common, you know, public spaces and there's restaurants and there's, you know, food prep and all, all that stuff. So yeah, it's it's very similar products, I would imagine. It is, and it's, it's they're run similarly. I, I remember um, I lost a, a general manager of one of my hotels to go run a, a major senior living facility. And it's, you know, they, they, they start, they're starting to dip into the hospitality world for people. Yeah. They've been doing that for a while. So yeah, it, it makes sense. We know people that know how to run hotels and operate hotels, it can pretty much figure out yeah. the, the rest when it comes to senior living. There's a healthcare component that's different, but. Yeah, for sure. I think we might have lost Robert. He warned yeah, us that the specifications might happen. Like, is um, sorry, go ahead, yeah. Shelly. Um, so Kim, just kind of talking about the board lines on the specification side, you know, we talked a little bit about the influencers for primarily the hotel chain. Would it be the same in senior living or is that again, much more fragmented where the owner has a bigger voice? Is it a strong reliance on A&D or can the flooring contractor play a big role in that specification of product? I think the flooring contractor plays a bigger role in, in the senior living segment, in my opinion. Um, there's, you know, senior living inside that room, the resident room, they will often um, change the carpet very frequently to just put in brand new flooring for the new for the new tenant, and so it, it that it becomes a stocking game for ownership at that point. So they need to be able to stock material and stock, um, you know, things locally. And the dealer is very involved and in, needs to be involved in that because they have the you know the warehouses and the ability to to, to keep those things. So I think that that in in senior living dealership has a, a much bigger influence. Um, but it's very, very, very much, Shelly, like hospitality in that you have major senior living developers that own multiple properties, hundreds of them, right. and those decisions are being made at that corporate level. So, um, and just like just like hospitality. So I think, and then again, A and D. When 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 ownership hires a firm, they're going to hire. Sometimes they hire. They, they have in in house design, but sometimes they don't. And when they don't, they're hiring those major A and D clients and. I think that influence there is, is still really important. Yeah. Great. I would think so too, as everybody's competing and, you know, senior living is competing for spend and dollars, much like hospitality. So I, I see how those become very yeah. blurred and the influences become very strong. Thanks, Kim. Yeah. And I think they called it the silver tsunami is what we learned uh, in our senior, senior living, yeah. you know, segment. Yeah. Um, and, and to Robert's point, it was, it was, I think it was even lower than that. I'll have to go rewatch <laughs> that, that thing. Yeah, I, I think it was about, I think it was more like 15 or 20% of the beds that are needed yeah. is what we currently have. So really? it is a huge I'll have to go market. watch that segment. You know, I, I'll, everything I'm saying about senior living is my opinion and my team will tell you I'm never without an opinion, but, but I, so I don't know that segment, <laughs> like I know hospitality, yeah. but, um, but it's, it's, it's coming for us. I yeah. feel like hospitality just has to get, get more embedded in that environment and, and more realistic about, um, how that really is going to cross over in yeah. the future and how influential we can be in that process. Well, definitely go watch it. Yeah, well, um, it's a great, it's a great point. use of 45, 50 minutes. Um, and if you're watching here and, and interested in that as well, I believe it was three or four months ago. So go check that out for sure. Um, Kim, any other trends that you see happening? What, uh, if, if you were to look at the hospitality market and say, okay, we've obviously gone through this crazy, I mean, really unforeseen, not just COVID, but then supply chain and all this stuff. But how do we come out the other side? Is this going to be a growing market? I know we've talked a little bit about, I think you said 2024. Mm -hmm. um, but what, what do you see energy wise, product wise, um, you know, what, what's coming for us you down know, the road? The everybody is bullish on hospitality. I came from a large lodging conference a couple weeks ago in Scottsdale and, um, you know, pre COVID, it was a, it was a thousand person event. It was a thousand person event again. Hmm. And it was great to see everybody, great to see ownership, great to see A&D. It was just a, a, a great to see franchise. A, a, in the room were everybody, 
was. Um, the, all the decision makers were. Everybody is is bullish on hospitality. There's no you can't hear one person that's feeling like it's 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 going to be another laggard year. We know there's growth. Some are saying two percent growth. Some are saying it's going to be more. And how does that growth translate into people like us who who have product? Because um, it's you know when you when you talk about the metrics where hospitality measures themselves, it's all in that operational metric, that rev par. Yeah. Um, so, uh, but we believe that. Uh, the franchises, uh, you know, they're putting money in in extended stay. Families, the trend is, Seth, I think uh, families are wanting, have really come through a really rough time. And they're all stepping back and f- trying to figure out who they are as a family and how do they want to experience the world. Right. And mm. I think they're... Um, they're driving a lot of the decisions that franchise is making. Uh, you know, there's more and more of the extended day type uh, chains coming out, and, and I think that's important. You know, so that you can stay a week, you can have a little kitchen, you can have, you don't have to go out to eat for every meal. You can put cereal and milk, you know, on the, you know, to the kids in the morning. And uh, so I think that that the trend is really around experiences for the guest. Mm. And um, an experience can mean anything from, you know, the hotel environment to just local food, local art shows, local music. Kimpton does an utterly fabulous job of pulling in um, the guests and, and enticing them in through experiences. Mm. So I think that's where it's going. There's a lot of talk about biophilic design. How do you bring nature into the property and how do you, um, how do you, you know, have a communal space in a property when everybody's been told to socially distance yeah. for the last 18 months. So, um, so, so do you think that the, the hospitality world would have been headed there anyway, or do you think that some of this is a result of COVID and a result of the, the pullback? I think it was going there anyway. Again, just my opinion. I felt it was going there anyway. I think it amplified hmm. and really, um, put us on a faster track to, to getting there. Um, I, we were always trying to figure out the guest experience. It's, right. you know, at, at a hotel level, it's, it's trying to um, appeal to the guests there. You can take them away from their favorite brand or favorite points, you know. Um, but I think anymore, you know, it's all about families and spending time. We were, when we were developing hotels, we were developing, um, very large communal spaces. Everybody wanted to be around one big table and everybody wanted to just, you know, have have just massive space. And now it's more about how you can create pockets of space where if you don't want to be around the mass, right. you can pull yourself, but you still want to be yeah. in a public environment, you can pull yourself out of your guest room and still have a, yeah. a place to feel safe. Be social in an isolated method. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, yeah. Exactly. Huh, okay. Um, Robert and Shelley, don't forget about accommodating your pets. Traveling with right. pets is a big deal. Yeah. So true. And that's where LVT comes in, too. Because, Everybody uh, got a dog. Every, Kimpton right. does a great job of welcoming pets. I, I, I know I've been, I've been, I, yeah. I love Kimpton for that. And I have pets of my own. But it's, a, it's, it's hard on housekeeping to yeah. have pets in a hotel. It really is. So, again, I think that drives a lot of those decisions about what you put in a guest room. Yeah. Um, and noise because pets tend to bark when you're not there or, you know, and things right. have accidents happen on the floor. So um, pets are a big part of Americans' yeah. lives anymore. And I think we're going to see it, definitely see that trend continue, Shelly. Yeah. And Shelly, you have the world's largest dog. <laughs> so I don't know how any hotel would let I you do. walk it in was with that horse. Quiet today. <laughs> <laughs> uh, she's got a, a great Dane that's just, you said he's how, how big? 210 pounds? 210 pounds. Yeah, he's a yeah. pony. I mean, yeah. just I'm surprised he didn't huge. make an appearance. He usually does. Yeah. <laughs> um, Jeez, that's well, I well, we are we are coming up uh, right at the end of our show. Um, but, Kim, I do want to ask you before we leave, uh, if, if I was watching today, and to our viewers, to those who are watching, um, I just want you to, to say just kind of your, your bottom line of, hey, what's your piece of advice that you would give for this market? It's obviously a growing market. Um, everyone's feeling like it's going to come back and come back with a vengeance. It's got some really cool stuff happening. So what, what advice would you give somebody um, that wants to get into this market? 
I think it'd be a, I think it's a great market to get into. I'll talk about it from an installation standpoint for a moment. Um, one of my biggest challenges, and, one of, and as a supplier and as an and as an owner, was I'm finding qualified installers. Um, mm. It would be hone your craft, right? Just yeah. hone your craft. I, I can't tell you how many times an installation crew would show up on property and not have the proper tools, a, you know, a, a, mm. a, a power stretcher or you know, things that got, got those big pattern repeats to match, right? Um, so hone your craft, be really good, because then at that point when you, when, you, when you have the reputation of being a very good installer, you can charge more and ownership will pay that because you do know what you're doing. You're not gonna have a claim at the end of it. You're gonna get them through a, a problem a, a, you know, or a challenging installation. And um, I think the second part of that would be to, to be a relationship seller. I, yeah, installers sometimes don't realize how important a relationship is at that level. It's not only about it's not always about the supplier having the relationship. It's about the installation. It's it, in our world, install is as equally important as the product. Yeah. And so, um, just having that relationship with ownership, they they are driving massive decisions. They will be driving even more next year. Their challenge is finding labor to install as well. So, yeah. hone your craft and build your relationships. And I think you will, that would be for me a very successful installation environment. I don't know, Robert, you probably have a different Perfect. opinion. Perfect. No, that's, <laughs> that's I, I don't think, uh, I don't think we could have said it better. So, um, and Robert, I'm not going to let you say it better because we're out of time. <laughs> so, uh, so Shelly and Robert, thank you. No, I won't. You. She did a phenomenal job. Uh, uh, you, literally, you said pretty much what I would have said. And, and you did make a comment earlier, and I would encourage you know contractors to do the same. Is you know if you're not in any of this kind of business, reach out to those management companies because again, if you do have the skill sets that are needed to do the large patterns, to do the accidents, do the double sticks, everything, uh, then yeah, you can certainly charge a little bit more for those if you're dealing directly with those management companies. Yes. Yep. Yes. Well, Shelley, thank you for joining us. Um, it was a pleasure to have you as always. Robert, thank you so much for being here as well. Kim, so lovely to have you in studio. My Great pleasure. to meet you. Thanks for having me. Um, for sure. And, uh, and I just want to remind all of our viewers, be sure to uh, like us, follow us on social media, go subscribe to our newsletter. It comes out every first Tuesday of the month. Don't forget to tune in next month for Taylor Time Live. It'll be the third Tuesday and it's gonna be on the retail segment. So be sure and check that out. Um, download our app and figure out all things Taylor. Thank you so much for joining. Um, and remember at Taylor Adhesives, we're with you every step.